Hey, everybody. We're live. Oh, look at all the people waiting. Holy smokes. Hey, good to see you all here. Um, let me know where you're from and let me know what episode of The Connected Dog you have watched up to so far. I am coming to you from lovely, balmy um, Fort McMurray, Alberta today. So Fort McMurray is like a stone's throw from Santa Claus in the North Pole. It's really um, a lot further north than where I live. And west, it's way west. Hey, Allison, I know where you're coming to me from. Much balmier than where I am. Vancouver. Okay, so Corinne has watched all of them. Um, who else has watched them all? Bay Area for Dana. Caught up with all of them again. Quinn's all caught up. Pat's on episode four. You still got the weekend, Pat. Let's get going. Episode four, that's good. You know what? Take your time. Marianne seen them all. Lorena, Lorena, nice name. Lorena McKinnick, one of my favorites. Um, Lorena have watched have watched them all at least once. Awesome. So a lot of you, so some of you have watched, uh, Sarah's watched one, two, and three. Linda from Norway has watched all of them at least three to four times. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because, you know, the first time you might watch it just to, to let it sink in, like, um, do I, is this new? Is this, do I, do I get it? Do I believe in this? The second time you're like, I do believe in it. Maybe I'm going to take notes the second time. The next time you might watch it and um, and just look at the dog training. The last time you watch it, here's what I would like you to do. If you haven't done this, don't watch any of the dogs. Don't watch the dogs because the most learning is going to come to you if you can watch the mechanics of the trainers. So see if, if you can pick up the, the things that you would like to change that you think should be changed, the things that you might be doing that I might be doing that you, you could change. Okay, I have a question for you. Now, I want you to think of this in terms of your relationship today, not before you, you went through the connected dog. Um, well, you can put both. Your, what one word would you use to describe your relationship with your dog prior to the connected dog? And would that be the same word today? And it's the majority of the time I feel like my relationship with my dog is magical. The majority of the time I feel like it is, well, we tolerate each other because I know they'd like, my dog like to do a lot more different things than I would. And I'd like to do a lot, right? So what one word and ideally if you could give me one word before you went through the connected dog and one after, that would be ideal. And you know what? This is a safe place. So you don't have to worry about being embarrassed. There's no, there's no guilt. There's no shame. Remember, we're grace-filled humans now. You can't pick one word. I gave you some su some suggestions for one word. Um, I see my sister out there, Mary Lynn. I just my um, so I'm my my younger sister flew in is flying in from uh, British Columbia, and my younger brother is uh, coming in from Ontario too. So we're the we're, we're having a weekend here uh, with family. Okay, so before Bobby. Uh, Bubbleen said, hopeless, now hopeful. Oh, that is so beautiful. I love that. Bab, Babbeen. Babbeen. It's a cute name. Um, hopeful. Food service to friends. That's awesome. Uh, where did it go? Um, magical and magical. Beautiful. Inadequate, 
I love the honesty and the vulnerability to even put that out there, Anna. Absolutely. Frustrated and now hopeful. Beautiful. Okay, so if you're joining us late, I would love to know what one word you would use to describe your relationship with your dog most of the time. And we all have our moments, right? In any relationship, there are times it's like, most of the time, prior to the um, workshop, the Connected Dog series, and now that you've been through it, as much as you've been through. Confused and now motivated, that's great. Beautiful, Patricia. Clueless, now connected. I love it. Okay, while you guys answer that question, I'm going to give away some prizes. I don't have any prizes to show you, but I have pictures of prizes I can show you. So first of all, I'm going to share with you, you can win a prize today. We will be giving away today a um, For My Merles, let's do two of them two For My Merle's frizzers. And we're going to give away two of those. This, I'll show you what they look like. Hold on. I do have a picture. It's a little more difficult for me with pictures than grabbing an actual frizzer. But um, okay, that's the frizzer. We're going to give away uh, For My Merle's frizzer. And we're going to give away two of them. And all that you have to do is share this, this live stream right now to social media. Come back right in the comments that you shared it, where you shared it. And somebody on my team is going to put you in our draw. We're going to do two. You know, every time we've gone live this week, I've done one. We're doing two. And actually, we have done two. So let's go crazy. Let's do three. We're going to do one at the end of today. Now, that's going to require you guys reminding me. At the end of today, we'll draw for a For My Merle's Frizzer. And then sometime, next, I don't know, next time I go live, I'm going to draw for, on this live stream, I'll do a draw for another Frizzer and for a, a Blue Nine harness. I love those harnesses. Okay, so that's all you have to do. Share and, and write so, Jan, you just share it and write in the comments where you shared it. I shared it on my Facebook page. I shared it on Instagram and Facebook. I shared it on wherever you shared it. Come on back here. And right now, I am going to tell you who won our last ones. Okay, so now I've got to look this up because I had it all pulled up for myself and my iPad. Okay. Uh, share winner from last time. We only had, we only had one, see? And it was Maureen Murray. Boom, ba -doom. Doing three shares this time. So we're going to do one at the end. We're going to do one, um, and we're going to do two next time I go live. All right. Now we also had a lot of beautiful gems. So today I'm going to do a lot of uh, answering your questions. I'm going to show you some videos. And so if there's something that sticks out to you today as an aha, as man, that's, that's something I never considered. That's a way I've never heard it before. Then I would like you to keep that in mind, write it down. And at the end of this uh, um, live stream, I'll share, I'll share with you how you can win from that. Okay, so this was our gem from last, from our last, our last um, live stream. So the winner was Martina Sal Salaba. And I'm just gonna make sure that I got that right. Okay. Uh, Martina wrote, the relationship with our dog is not linear. It's circular. We are constantly giving each other feedback. It's a process which we need to become aware of so it can help us learn and grow. Work with the dog in front of you, but also the person in front of the dog. Be kind, be, be patient, be understanding. It will be okay. Thank you, Martina. That was beautiful. What I want, like what I want from you guys to, 
you, you know, I've been telling you all along that our dogs need to feel safe. They learn best when they feel safe. And when they feel safe, we work on them feeling good and growing confidence. It's exactly the same with you. You need to feel safe. You, I don't want you feeling guilt or shame or regrets because we're starting today. Today is day one. So just anything that, that you, you have been applying in a wrong way, anything that you've been taught that, that you now realize, I shouldn't have done that to my dog. Come on, you come with me. You're just wiping that off. That doesn't serve you, my friend. You need to show up your best self for your dog. And so you don't bring that baggage with you. You leave it behind. I like to just, that's what I like to do with stuff like that. Anything that's bothering me, it's gone. It's gone because you need to feel safe to be, to be at your best for your dog. All right. So share, I'm going to, I'm going to start with, um, with the questions because we did have a lot of really, really good questions. So, and we'll go through them one game. Now, there were four games that I promised you, and then the surprise bonus game was the hot zone. And at the end, we'll we'll just go into a little bit more detail about the value that's going to bring to your life. So what we've done is we've taken parts of some of our introductory, I call them core games for our dogs. And you'll see these core games in every single program that I have online. So recallers will grow the core to get deeper understanding in different areas. Um, but it's all about being an amazing family pet versus handling 360 is our dog agility uh, handling course where it grows the games in a different connected because in, in agility, you need your dog to be connected with you, but you won't be staring at your dog and you don't want your dog staring at you because in that sport, you're, you're watching the obstacles and running a path connected with your dog peripherally and your dog's got to keep their eyes on the obstacles and just listen to your verbal cues and, and follow your body with their peripheral vision. So there's still a deep connection. So our Handling 360 games go in a different direction than our recaller games. Um, okay, so yes, Handling 360 is absolutely from the beginning. Um, and, you know, we have people that jump into Handling 360 and we say, you could do with better connection. And we would suggest they jump, they drop back into recallers. We make that happen for them. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I got questions that you've asked. So the first one came from, comes from Lee's. Um, in Collar Grab, my five-month-old standard poodle tends to want to bite my hands. He especially wants to bite my hands when I combine with search. How can I break this habit without losing my cool? Okay, Lee's, first of all, no, there's no there's no cool to lose because we're just observing this is the behavior and why is it there because you've got a five-month-old puppy it's cool that's that there's no reason for you to go oh my gosh this is wrong you need to stop but what we can do is say how is what i'm doing reinforcing you for biting and so it might be um as simple as putting your cookie up. And if the dog snaps at it, just closing your hand around it until the dog licks. When the puppy licks at your hand, then I would give them cookie. It's just a little bit, a longer version of it's your choice. So if you're snapping, then I'm not giving it to you. And, and you say they, they go particularly when you do the search game. Well, of course, because I want to get that value before it hits the floor. I'm going to get that as fast as I can. That's human nature. I bet your dog would be your puppy be really easy to teach to catch. All right, so what can we do? We can start placing the food on the floor and then saying search and then dropping it for maybe two inches away and then saying search and then dropping it for a little higher and a little higher. Break it down so that you're growing confidence and understanding, right? Um, Nicole, I'm playing collar grab and it's your choice with some of the shelter dogs I walk or take out for items. Big, big hearts to you, Nicole, for working with the shelter dogs. Are there other recaller games that might be particularly beneficial for the more balanced shelter dogs? All of them. All of them. They're, they're yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I know of uh, a couple of recaller dogs who are in their current home because 
the people who were working with them at the shelter, playing recaller games, fell in love with the dog and then took them home. So definitely all of them. And again, um, with the, the asterisks of where, you know, the dogs are sound dogs, like they, they don't have any sort of neurological issues that uh, create unpredictability in their, in, in their behavior. And I'm not saying then you can't do any, it's just going to be a little more guarded. And with, uh, I would recommend the supervision of a veterinarian behaviors. Okay. Corinne says, oh, for the, we're on to the research game. While I am working on teaching my one-year-old Labrador not to take food from the floor or ground, unless I say, okay, how do I manage her on loose leash walks where she's happily sniffing, often picking up things um, before I get to them. Sometimes food, although I try to be on the lookout, um, but also sticks. So there's a number of different pathways you can take to this. If I had a, a, a dog that was just obsessive about putting everything in their mouth, I would, there's a, a podcast episode, a Shape by Dog episode that we've done on conditioning a dog to, a, to wear a muzzle, because that could be very dangerous. Meanwhile, you're going to be playing It's Your Choice in all the rooms of your house, going out the threshold, going back in the threshold. How far out your out of your home can you go with your dog not picking something up? Now, also, search means go look for food. Um, sniffs or, or sniffies, whatever you want to call it, means you consent. But it doesn't mean you consent and try and find things, right? There's a big, big difference there. Uh, so it labs have a beautiful appetite that makes them so darn easy to train. Um, but the downside of that is they have a pretty high drive for food anywhere. And so that's why it's your choice as part of your ongoing life, recognizing like when you're watching TV, is your dog like licking the carpet or sniffing the corners of the room looking for treats? That's, that's, that's where it starts, right? So just try to be present for that. Um, Tommy, when I give my dog his dinner, should I say search? Um, Tommy, I think it's great to put your dinner, your dog's dinner down and let them stare at it before you release them to it. And the reason I like doing that has nothing to do with control or... Um, and, and I'll be very picky on the dogs. I will do it too. It's, I, I might start my border collies as puppies doing it a little bit, but I stop very fast, very quickly. My one border collie swagger, I did it for a very long time. Why? Because that's building anticipation and exciting excitement for the chance to eat. And the more that you crank up a dog for the chance to eat, ready, <laughs> the more you're going to get bolting and gulping of food. And that's not what I want. And so I don't do a lot of sit and stare at the food and release as the, as my dog gets beyond a puppy. I do it just because it's food. It's, it's your choice, but you can just, um, I wouldn't use the word search. It's, it's food in a bowl. You can, you can just say, get it. Yeah. Or if you're not having them sit, you're just putting it in front of them. You don't, you don't have to say anything. Um, you can just, you know, put it, yeah, I still say, get it. Usually I sing. So that's a different story. Um, but good question, Tommy. Uh, Celine, it's your choice. Uh, we're on, it's your choice. So Celine asks, hi, thank you for all of the videos. I love to go back to basics. I had a question. I never understood how to progress from it's your choice to the outdoors and to wildlife and squirrels. So, so then that's really recallers, but I can show you some, some stages. Like people say, okay, my dog won't go for the cookie I drop on the floor now. What can I do next? So I'll just show just a few little videos of belief when she was younger. I'm going to say she was like three or four months old. Um, and just some of the training progressions to get us to a place. Now she isn't hundred percent trustworthy. She's pretty good around small animals, not around Robins are her new thing. So um, it's a process you evaluate and then you change, right? There's what we have 
and then where we want to go. So this is belief um, with, she was obsessed with food. I mean, she's half Staffordshire Bull Terrier. So obsessed with food. Good girl. Good baby. Nice, went by all the cookies, all the cookies in the bowl. Come and pick up a cookie and give it to her and then keep tugging. Good girl. Got it. Ah, tug. The word's tug. It's tug. It's not. It's tug. Okay, come down to this bowl. Pick one. It's tug. It's tug. Thank you. Cookie. Tug. Yeah. Super good. Come out of this bowl. Oh, this this is one. roast beef. This is a hard one. This is a harder one. It's a harder one. You gotta hold on to it. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. Thank you. Cookie. Tug. Yeah. Superstar. Nice. So good. So good. Go to the next one and tell her sit and tell her she can have the cookie. Okay. Thank you. Sit. Tell her sir. search. Yay! And tug. Tug. Tug! <laughs> yeah! Super good. Super good. So that is food was a big distraction for that puppy. And then um, when she was younger, we did like people with, was a big distraction. People outside, people standing wasn't as she could do recalls. People um, sitting, we couldn't. So that's the same video. So here's another video. Um, here's, here's the one I'm looking for. So two of us are sitting on the ground trying to distract the puppy. So little games that I'm 99% sure that she'll be successful with. Why? Because all of the recaller games that get us to the point. So if you took your dog that has just gone through Connected Dog and you set that up, there's a possibility you might get a dog to recall by at once, but there's also probably an equal possibility that they're going to go, was that roast beef in a bowl on the ground? <clears throat> See ya. And they'll just eat all the cookies, right? So we want to get to a point where we have environmental neutrality where, and, and you can see when with her recalling by the people on the ground, she did a little like, oh, like they really want to stop, but I really can't stop. And so you test, you don't go from open and close your hand to the bunny farm. You test. So here's another little test for uh, belief. <laughs> Good baby. Good girl. So, so good. Go play. So you can see playing with tater salad, super high value reward. Coming out of play, I gave her one reward and I gave her the reward she really wanted was to get to play again. So it's, it's a way of life. And that's why we made, when we first had recallers, I think it was four months for the first two years. And then it's like, it's hard to integrate something to be a way of life in, in, uh, you know, months. So we made it a year so that you are, you are part of the community. You are um, sub submersed in the culture of what's the layer that I'm missing here. What's the layer that I need to work on now? How do I get that deepened connection with my dog? How do I move from, you know, a lot of people with their dog, and I, and like when they, when they come into say the connected dog, their, their, their relationship is one of blame and anger. They believe that the dog chooses, he's choosing to ignore me. Well, he may be ignoring you. That's your perception of what's going on. But what he's doing is what he's always done. He's doing what he wants to do. 
And so because it's a time when you want him to do something else, it's easy for our belief loop to bring us to a place where we think he's bad or I'm blaming him. He's choosing to be, it's his breed. It's, you know, his, his, his litter mates are the same way. And we create this story and, and it really is living in, um, in, in a little bit of ignorance of who that dog possibly is or could be. And so it's hard to help people that, in, that are in that state because they, they're so locked into this belief. And with just awareness of how your dog, the, 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 the more educated you get, the better trained your dog becomes. When you have that awareness, then you are you are out of that lower stage, and, and you're not you're not going back there. And then it's just growth heading on up to that magical connected connected dog stage. And I'm I'm going to show you while I'm here. I might as well show you. Um, I'm going to show you two more of our students. So um, that was belief, who is you know partly my dog and partly Kim's. And I'll show you some more with her later. Um, somebody asked in our call yesterday. Um, what if I don't have food on me? And I think it did like 12 or 13 behaviors with her without considering giving her any, any food or toys. Um, but, but here are people that started in our program, just like you with dogs that had a problem. So, um, could you so it's easy to say, um, that Nellie blew, was blowing her off. Nellie was on her own agenda. Nellie just wanted what she wanted. She smelt things in the ground. Oh, she's a field bred dog. That's why she's like that. That's who she is. She needs to know who's in charge. <music> so it's just communicating through the games, what you would like the dog to see value in doing, because they're not going to do it if they don't see value, or they might do it because they're afraid of what may happen to them. But if you're watching this, you don't want that. Okay. And before I forget, I'll, I'll show you one more. So this is Clara. She was an extreme case because she lived in a town. I always get this wrong. I think it's Slovenia. Um, I know Slovenia isn't a town. I recognize that's a country. She lives in a small town of Slovenia where there were feral cats everywhere in her town. And when she contacted us, said, I, I, I need help. Like, I cannot take this dog out for a walk. And this is what uh, it looked like when Clara... <laughs> So she just had, she said, I don't have much of what she was like before. She had a little bit. Um, and then this is where the games took her. So Clara, I think that video was, I don't know, four, four or five years ago. We caught up with Clara last year and uh, it, it just, we just sent her a text message. She sent us a picture back of her um, with her, hu with her husband at an outdoor cafe lying with like, she, they weren't lying. Clara was lying on the ground. Anyway, I'm just showing all that to, to be inspired that people just like you doesn't, you know, we, it's easy to feel a little overwhelmed and hopeless because well, mostly it's because you're comparing. You might be comparing to a dog you used to have. You might be comparing to your neighbor's dog. You might be comparing to your uh, your litter mates. And then you make, you dump it all on you that you're useless, you're hopeless, your dog can't do this. And and it's not, it's, it's not at all, um, right? Because yeah, the more you learn, the, the better the behave the dog becomes. Okay, so next question, um, Audrey. So, uh, Selena, I hope I answered your question. We can't go from kindergarten of introducing is your choice to post-secondary, maybe your third doctorate degree, going to the bunny farm and expect your dog to ignore wildlife. They will. If that's one of your goals, you can get there. 
but you have to be patient and put in the layers. Audrey says, for hot zone, should I only put the blanket down when we are playing and pick it up in between so that it remains a special spot and does, doesn't it, and doesn't just become part of everyday household scenery um, or leave it out and my dog is laying on it by your own choice? At first, that's a, a great question, Audrey. At first, I pick it up. Um, when I'm just conditioning it, I pick it up. I build some value for it. We end the game. I pick it up. And, you know, and then I move it around as you saw in the video, but eventually I leave it there because the magic happens. The dog goes, this is a good place to lie. And they start lying on it. And so I can randomly go around it and reward them whenever I see them lying on it, which builds more value for it. So I take that hot zone. I can take that to when I want to take the dogs to an outdoor restaurant. Like I, I only take one at a time as usually a young dog. Um, I've taken that when I've gone and trained at an airport where I've just used the, that. I use a little roll a mat and they know this is my spot and, and they're just getting used to all the distractions. We live by a very close, a little, very small airport and it's great to go in and train young dogs there. Okay. So at first, yes. And then I wouldn't like leave it out when you're going to work or something, but eventually, eventually it, it doesn't matter, but because it's just got so much magical power. Okay, Marie, uh, we've been learning hot zone and I continue to struggle with the release cue with one of my border collies. He looks at me like, are you crazy? Treats come to me when I'm in my hot zone. So I'm not moving until you walk away and I know it's really over. It, is that an okay behavior? Because then he's free to do what he chooses or do I need to try to get him off the hot zone? So we want through reinforcement based training to be in a place where our dogs understand when I ask you to do something, it's because I believe you understand the parameters of how to be successful. And so if they choose to not do something, that's not okay. And so what do we do? We examinate, we examinate, We examine the value. So first of all, Marie, good, good on you. You've created amazing value for the hot zone. Woo -woo, celebrate that. And now you've got to say, right, I need to low, uh, reverse the value. So they get in the hot zone. I might praise them and then say search and reward them or say, you know, if you've got your with me, you say you're in recallers. So use a what? but use higher value rewards for the next little while for the dog leaving when you ask. Then you mix up the value, right? It's like musical chairs. There's no reward for being off the chair. So you go by the chair very, very slowly and then you run as fast as you can to get near that chair because all the value is in getting in the chair. I hope everybody that's listening to this understands musical chairs. And it's the same with the dog. If we load up the value, we see this a lot with um, puppies in crate games. They they learn to love crate games so much that you say break and they'll make lower their head like, yeah, I got out and look at I'm here. Give me give me my cookies. And it's always funny because you know I did a great job of creating value here. Need time to do a little value reversal. Okay, um, Michelle. Oh, Michelle, I have a placemat that I can that I get Marvin to go on when people come to the door. For the search game, I have used a towel as I did not want to confuse him. I would say place, and he goes, should I keep the two separate or start using the bed from now on? So, Michelle, I would ask you the question, was the mat, the place cue created in a way that the dog their ears on the top of their head, their eyes are bright and they fly as fast as they can to get there when you say that word. If not, that's the way I want my dogs to have, like hop it up is boom, yeah, yeah, I'm there. So I would transition your place to your hop it up or you know, your hot zone, hot zone I use hop it up. Okay, so if you can, you can um, just have it all become one, but if you've got better accuracy, like when I tell my dogs to get in a hot zone, I don't want their feet hanging over. And trust me on this one, if you think, I'm not going to be that particular about it, Susan, then this 
toes on the floor become elbows on the floor become I don't have a picture handy of my old girl feature who would play crate games with literally one toenail of one back foot in the crate. They take, you know, that, that you have made the criteria less clear. All, everything out on the mat, that's clear, especially if you have a little roll. But if this is okay, then this has got to be better. And then this has got, so it gets messy. So if you've got excellence in your criteria for your place, then you can go ahead with that. But um, if the accuracy or the joy in the dog is better with what you're doing now, then I would stick with it. Um, Kesslin, how do I go about teaching a border collie cross not to chase running children in the house? Is it okay to put them in the hot zone once they have solid understanding so they know they should not go? Okay, well, you've got to understand, Kesslin, herding dogs innately will herd. And so can you teach the dog that every time they see the children, they should go in their hot zone? Absolutely you can, but it's gotta be at least as valuable as hurting the kids because otherwise it's not going to stay. So you've got to use super high value rewards for that dog. And also, um, so, so that we create it calm in a, in a calm way. So at first it might be the kids are watching TV. You're in the hot zone. When the kids are doing their screaming and running, you're going to run the run outside and play catch with the dog. We're not going to, we're not going to punish them by saying, get in your room. We're going to do something that's fun for the dog. All right. And then it might be they're in the hot zone and you get the, the kids, you got to get the kids involved in this because I mean, kids are great dog trainers and um, I love to see them in, in, you know, playing the recaller games. So you get the one, one child to walk very calmly by the dog and she can, or he can toss a cookie in the bed as they walk by and uh, um, say search, but keep it on the bed. And then they just take turns doing that until the dog says, oh, cool, this is where I be. Uh, do you have any criteria for a dog position on the hot zone? Um, the only criteria, Robin, is that, that your feet stay in the hot zone. So they can stand, lie down, sit, you know, sit, lay on their back, lay on their side. They can roll, scratch their back, tater saddle, it often will do that. Um, all right. Now I'm going to, I'm going to try and <coughs> keep watching to see if you guys have other questions. <laughs> Nancy says, I put the kids in the hot zone. That's a crack up. Um, I'm not pulling vodka. I'm just pouring water, but I don't want to. Don't want to uh, um, do it. Donna, you're very kind. I got up at five o'clock in the morning and got on a plane. So that's that's the way it is. Um, some general questions. Tori asks, uh, reason for the leash. These trainings are going really well so far with my four month old hound. Oh, four month old hound. Awesome. Get, you got a four month old hound. You keep training often. It will pay, pay, pay big dividends. Um, I do have a quick question. What's the reason for the leash? What is the reason the leash should remain on during these trainings? There's many, many reasons. The first one is it limits the access to other external reinforcers. So this is particularly true if there's a failure. So you close the hand on the dog, especially with a lot of hounds there, I'm tapping out. This just got hard and I'm gonna go and find a bone to chew on. And then what are you gonna to have to do? You're gonna to have to call them back. You're gonna to have to inter, I don't want you to intervene that way. It's the dog's choice. It's a dog's choice on a lead that's kind of close. That's one reason. Number two, a lot of dogs have a conditioned emotion response to the leash. Many are, cray cray they get psycho when when the leash is on any chance we can get to create a more calm conditioned reinforce uh, uh, a more uh, conditioned response to the leash i would so if you're playing you know a game that is connecting you and not getting the dog screaming and looking out what's going on and where we're going that can only be good we want to create more conditioned emotional responses to the leash connects you and I. So we are being connected in this game. 
If you only put on a leash for water skiing down the street, then it's really the, the CER is, has nothing to do with you. And um, at best, at best, it would be neutral, but probably it would be um, a negative conditioned emotional response for the dog. All right. So there's two, two of the, two of the biggies. Um, so from Susan, no, it wasn't me, but good on you for using the full name. Should I use the word cookie whenever I deliver food directly to my puppy's mouth? Example, I've been giving him a few pieces of kibble during and after I brush him. So it associates being brushed with good things. Yes. So absolutely. And here's how you do it. Let's say I have no props today. So let's say the, uh, my, my hair elastic is, is the cookie. So then what I would do is I would be brushing and I would pick up the cookie. And if the dog goes, Oh yeah. And goes for it. Then I just put it back down and do more brushing. Right. Always doing it's your choice. That's a hair elastic. I don't want that. Always doing it's your choice in conjunction with everything you do. So I would pick it up. And when I know that the dog is going to just chill up, chillax while I bring it in, then I'll say cookie and I can bring it in. Okay. Um, Janelle, puppies unwanted behavior. We are planning to get a puppy and I want a different way to train rather than correcting. We have two indoor cats. If puppy goes to chase them, how do you deal with that in do land? Or would you not let the puppy loose in the house while learning the foundation games so it can it can't practice behaviors like chasing the cat. Yes. Um, I saw about setting up the puppy zones. So we are moving puppies through the house to the zones in the house and start at, at the start until we get some connection and foundations. And Janelle, like nailed it. Nailed it. So we have our little puppy zones. We call them the gated communities with a X pen. And so I will have one of those in the kitchen. The bedroom, I generally just use my crate and it's um, by my bed and um, one in my office for sure. And one in whatever training area that I'm training in. So I have a training den downstairs. And so there'll be uh, an area set up down there when I have a puppy, possibly out in the building where I'm training too. So you nailed it. Just do not give that new puppy access to make poor choices because it's unfair to the cats. It's, you know, it's unfair to the, to the wildlife to have puppies chase the, the, like think of the, the, you know, the stare, the stress release in those poor critters that are getting chased by dogs that are out of control. I just, I think it's wrong. And so, yeah, let's keep them on leash, keep them learning every day, make connection games with them. Before you know it, the, the cats are going to be white noise unless you have a herding breed. And then it's a little harder because they will, will want to herd them. Uh, Katia, treat questions. I finished the dog, the dogs app program, Connected Dog. It was really good. Thank you. But I am confused about one thing. We keep giving a variety of treats as positive reinforcements while playing games. At which point will it no longer be necessary to give a treat for the dog for a particular behavior? What does this transition look like? So the, the cookies are the deposits in the bank. And you can get to a place provided you absorb the learning from the connected dog and you ideally keep working with us so we can keep reminding you of the good mechanics of making sure that you give a cue and then wait for a response and then move your hand to reinforce. Good transfer of value. You will get to a place where um, you won't need, I'll show you this video that I mentioned. Uh, this was, I did this yesterday because we had a similar question that came up yesterday. So we'll get to a place, I gotta find that video now. You'll get to a place where um, you don't have to reward everything. Here it is. So this is, um, and the, the sound isn't great on this. I forgot to turn my microphone on, oh, rookie mistake. But I give her 
12 different cues. Two of them she was excited and didn't do right away. So I, um, you can see what I did. Um, I'll turn my mic on so I can, I'll, I'll tell you where those are. Okay, so this is, see if on behavior two or three, you see a drop in her enthusiasm because she didn't get a cookie or a toy. See if, you know, by behavior 10, she starts sniffing the ground because oh, my, I'm, a, I'm a cookie fed dog. Why am I not getting cookies? What's going on? See if you can see a difference. Ready? Side. That was a terrible one. Side. Side. Release. And push. Ready? 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 And yeah. So that was when I asked her. Okay, so so he said it, give her anything. Ready, set. What was it doing? Yeah, ready, set. Your camera. Job. So I asked her to do a bunch of behaviors, and then I asked her to get in her kennel, and there was no lack of enthusiasm for any of them. So yes, you can get to a place where you never have to give reinforcement, but eventually your bank account will go dry. Like it's like any, any relationship. Why would you want to never reinforce your dog again? If you are in a relationship of mutual respect and love, of course you'll want to give and receive reinforcement every day. And dogs are no different. And so sometimes it could be a pat. Sometimes it could be scratches. Um, toys are definitely my and my dog's love languages. That sounded really bad, but you know what I mean? <laughs> to toys are my dog's love languages. Like we play together with toys mostly, but when they're puppies, it's a lot of reinforcement because they're little sponges and there's so many things to teach them. And so... Reinforcement never goes away. It never does. I, I do uh, probably, I'm guessing, 60 or 80% of the time that I'm working, I am working on um, sharing do excellent dog training for people who have no obligation to give me a single penny. But I'll still get reinforcement from some of the kind things they say. I still get reinforcement by people showing up on lives. If, if I didn't, I'd probably still do it because I know I'm helping dogs. But I probably at some point wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. And so I, I think if you think of it in terms of what do you do every day of your life that you get no reinforcement from? None. How Many years would you go to a job that you were never paid for and that people were unkind to you or were at neutral at best? They don't have to be mean. They just were inert. How, that's not how life works. All animals do what's reinforcing. They do. And if we're not going to be the ones reinforcing our dogs, they will find their own reinforcement somewhere else in life. It could be barking at people as they cross in front of your big bay window. It could be fence fight, fighting with a neighbor's dog. It could be digging holes in the backyard. They will find their own reinforcement and they're not bad dogs for doing it. It's us that wants them to live in our world. And so, you know, it's... Don't, I don't, I think the need, people's need to lose the food is because, you know, the old training where we always lured the dogs everywhere with a cookie in front of the nose. That's not how we, this program works. That's not how we ever ask anybody to interact with their dogs. So every session that you do with your training, the wheels are spinning in the dog and you're building more and more connection between the two of you. So it's awesome to reinforce that. It's, it's just awesome. Um, but that's a, that's a question we get quite 
commonly. And um, yeah, I, I hope I made it, I hope it made it clear without making it sound like a judgment. Like it's just how I feel about dogs. I just love them. And not just my own. I was following my niece into a grocery store this morning and she went in the store and I went this way. I didn't realize it wasn't following her because I saw a dog. And she, I heard her turn around saying, where did you go? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Katrina, does your program have strategies to deal with counter surfing for food? Absolutely. It's dew land. So we just put in strategic layers. You've got two biggies. It's your choice and hot zone. So you should have hot zones ar around your house that are outside of the kitchen. So my dogs just, there's no need for my dogs to be in the kitchen. They can walk through the kitchen because I have a big open concept. Like the kitchen's kind of the center of the whole first floor. So they can walk through the kitchen. Zero need for any dog to hang out in the kitchen. And so there's beds outside of the kitchen. If they want to hang out where I am, if I happen, I don't really cook that much anymore. But if if I was in there and they wanted to be in there, they can hang out at the beds. And guess what? I still reinforce them for hanging out in their beds. So, yes, there's more and more layers. You saw one of the games with all the cookies in the bowl, recalls by the bowl. That's another great layer that gets dogs to ignore garbage cans and counters. There's, but there's many games in between those as well. Um, can you walk me through again what to do when I'm training for squirrels to become white noise? So environmental neutrality. Environmental neutrality, that's what we're looking for. And so can, um, can the dog, here's another little clip of, of belief. Oops, sorry. So every environment that I know my dog and I will be in, I want that to be a neutral environment for my dog, right? So that um, eventually, like she'll go to fly ball or maybe fly ball tournaments and agility. And I don't want her to be one of those lunging, choking dogs. So I start from a distance and play recaller games from a distance and we will do the same sort of, there's five or six different recaller games that all play around the, um, I have a bird feeder in my backyard and she right now is obsessed with robins. So you get environmental neutrality in your kitchen when the door gets, the fridge door gets open or a cheese wrapper gets unwrapped or whatever it is that is the trigger that makes the dog get, I, I, I want, I need. So, and then you just grow that environmental neutrality so that you're the important one. Those other things, literally my dogs have been almost clipped in the butt by deer because I'll call them in, the deer will path, will cross the path uh, this one Sunday morning. And I'm like, did you guys not even see that deer? And it was deer and a baby. Yeah, no, you called us. I wasn't really looking at anything else. So that's where we're heading. And it's not about the breed of dog. It's just about um, working through it in with patience in strategic layers. Um, okay, how do I, uh, this is from Michelle. How do you deal with a dog that's afraid of certain object, ob, obs, objects? My dog has fear of things that are unexplainable to me. Would recallers help her overcome her fears and build her confidence? Possibly. I'm not going to say everything's unicorns and rainbows when uh, people join recallers because fear is, there's so many triggers. But I know if you can get the dog playing a game a certain distance from that fear, 
that's how it can be overcome. I've mentioned it many times that this was terrified of children, of other dogs, of men, of well, skateboards, you name it. And so I, I didn't take her to the park where all those things were. I took her to a conservation area where I could sit up on a hill or on a picnic table and play recolor games X distance away. But also, Michelle, I would uh, encourage you to look at, I can't remember the number of the podcast and I should know it, uh, Shape by Dog episode on, on This Is Story. And sometimes when you have fears, it's as simple as not getting them better. You still have to do these games. But changing This Is Diet made a massive, massive difference in her fears that the games were a lot easier from a closer distance. All right. And now like she does, I, I can take her anywhere. She doesn't have a problem at all. Okay. Um, okay. So now I'm going to go and check and see if there's any other um, questions. Wow. Look at the time. How did that happen? So I'll check in with the team. Uh, how do we use these games to deal with demand barking? Ooh, the biggest thing of demand barking is recognizing its awareness. That's really what it is, is um, recognizing where, um, when it happens. So journaling is what, what we're doing right now with, with the doodle. I'm trying to move this. That's hysterical. Uh, with the doodle, that's what we're doing right now is journaling. When is the demand barking happen happening? And like how soon before, how soon after training? What are the triggers? And definitely you've got to get them to, um, to a place where you can recognize the, the motivation and the reinforcement. That Those are the biggies. And honestly... Um, I think we need to, after dealing with this puppy, um, I said to Linda, I think we might need another, yet another little focus in recallers on demand barking because it's definitely a challenge. Um, okay. Before I forget, I want to give, I want to give away our frizzer. So Rose Leet, L-E-A-T, you're winning our, our share frizzer right now. We're going to do two more. Um, on my next live, I'll give away two more. I also want to make sure you're aware on Sunday, uh, Sunday at midnight or Monday morning, let's call it Monday morning, the Connected Dog series is going away. So watch and rewatch it this weekend. Think about your application. No, this is, this is like you, you've got a hand on the rungs of the ladder. You're just starting on the journey. So there's, you've seen great, great improvement, but it's, it's just the beginning. And you, um, and we will on Monday morning, we will be opening registrations for recallers. It, it will only be open for four days. We do this once a year where we invite people to go through the connected dog or whatever series that we're hosting at that time, where we help coach you through your questions. And then we open up the opportunity to continue on with us for a year, myself and my coaches. So more on that on Monday. And so, but what I really want you to do is download the playbook handouts, take notes, rewatch those videos, Rewatch these lives, guys, because that will be a, a massive help. The clarification questions that people have had, um, they'll all be so helpful to you in your understanding of the concepts that were being presented in the connected dog and how to grow those moving forward. Okay, so now we are going to give away a one of my favorite pieces of fitness equipment. Let me just show you. Uh, it's called a Propel and it looks like that. So it's um, those little gray things that the dog's standing on. That the, There's two Propels there. I'm gonna give away one Propel. 
And the good people at, at Blue Nine, they're amazing people. Let's have some hearts for the all of our sponsors. They've been phenomenal. Um, they are going to ship it right to you. So here's how you can win a Propel. Is somebody on my team is going to put a link to our Facebook page where there'll be a post with a gem on it for you to jump over there and share your big takeaway from today's live. You could eat if you if you want. You could also put in your big takeaway from the connected dog, and you could just say big takeaway from the live and do another post. Big takeaway from the connected dog, right? So, and then on um, next live, maybe we'll leave this one for sure for Monday. I will. I don't know. I might not be back in time because I'm flying home late, but. If I fly home in time, Monday evening, I'll do a, a quick live. Otherwise, it'll be Tuesday. So either Monday or Tuesday, we're going to give away a Propel. Okay, so that's how you do it. I'm just going to scroll through the comments one more time. Um, thank you for that, LJ. Recall this is the best investment you can make to grow your connection. I joined after last year's Connecting Dog. Best decision ever. You're awesome. So, yeah. Uh, this is beautiful, Tammy. Tammy wrote, aha, just now, I need to give myself permission to move beyond my self-imposed barriers. So many people every year go through the connected dog and they see a difference and they say to themselves, well, that's good enough. That's good enough. And that and and it and, and so they don't want to go on with recallers because it's good enough. It's better. It's good enough. So, like, what if you went to the dentist and he was filling your tooth and he said, yeah, "It's good enough," and then he sent you on your way? Why do you not deserve better than good enough? Are you enjoying the learning? Are you like me, a lifelong learner, and just geek out on? the application of science. You don't have to be, but if you are, you're going to love it. Recallers is about you no, no longer saying it's good enough. I can do this. I proved myself that I can. I proved to myself that my dog can. So we do this every year for everyone to learn. But to me, I, I think you all need to stand up and say, my dog and I deserve better than good enough. So consider, consider joining us when re registration is open on Monday. Um, okay. And there's no time, like, you know, you can wait until it's the right time. It's never going to be the right time. It's just not going, it's, there's never a right time. You just need to throw your hat in the ring and say, I'm in, right? More about that next week. And uh, I know that we have recaller students I know that are going to jump in on this. But for now, I, I'm looking and I don't see any more questions. We'll talk about recallers next week. And if I don't see any more, more questions, I am going to... Um, now, this is... I'm going to highlight Lisa. Best decision I ever made for my dog and has improved my entire life. Lisa, look at the kind of dog Lisa has, Siberian Huskies. She does a phenomenal job with them through recallers. Okay, I'm signing off, guys. I'm going to go visit with my family. So thank you for jumping in here on this live with me. And I'll see you next time. Remember, Gem, over on the page or in the connected dog. I'll see ya.